This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 10. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins at the same time we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and the time and all that you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we started chapter 22 last time, went over the first nine verses. Let's read through that together. Verse 1, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of its street. Also on each side of the river was a tree of life producing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any division, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his slaves will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits, of the prophets, sent his angel to show his slaves what must soon happen. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Verse 10 begins the epilogue and final instructions. This is the final major point of our outline and takes us to the end of the book. Verse 10. Then he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. This verse has some interesting uh, thoughts in it, important thoughts, some we've seen before. Let's break it up. First of all, to seal up is to keep something from being looked at and or secured. In this, the command is not to seal the words up. Then the reason, because the time is near. Now, if you've been with me in the study of this book, or back in Daniel, you would know he was told to seal certain things up. Now, John is told not to seal things up, and the reason is important because the time is near. This makes a uh, firm connection with the book of Daniel. Just these lines alone. This is a message that his generation to ours, up to ours, needs to hear. These things will start being fulfilled soon, talking to John in his day, some passages as soon as they are received as with we saw with the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Daniel had been told to seal his words more than once. We see it in 8.26, 12.4, and 9-10. through 10. Let's look at those verses and the underlying phrases especially to point some things out. And this is really quite wonderful the way the Lord has done this because we see the connection between these two books 
and how privileged we are to have the unsealed words. Daniel 8.26, the vision of the evenings and mornings which have been told is true, but seal up the vision because it refers to many days from now. This is a command to Daniel. He's to seal up what he's seen. It doesn't refer to anything soon in his day, many days from now. Try to remember these phrases, many days from now. Verse 4, chapter 12, But as for you, Daniel, close up these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go here and there and knowledge will increase. So a lot of time is going to pass. People are going to learn things. But these things you're going to seal up. They're not going to be understood. Verse 9 of chapter 12. Then he said, Go, Daniel, for these words are closed up and sealed until the time of of the end. Again, time of the end. So the time of the end is basically those many days from now that we saw in the upper verse. Verse 10, many will be purged and purified and refined, but the wicked will go on being wicked, and none of them, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. So this is a good verse and helping us understand over history. It goes on. Uh, the wicked will go on being wicked. You're not going to stop them being wicked. And they're not going to understand these things. But there are going to be some who have insight. And folks, that's you. That's you. You're getting insight right now as we study through the book of Revelation. Now let's try to piece this together a little better. Many of the writings of Daniel would remain a puzzle for generations to come. The interpretation would be difficult for a number of reasons. So for some 500 years until the generation of John, much of what was spoken of about the future remained very difficult to fathom. But then, with the coming of Christ in the days of Rome, one, and then added insight from Christ's teachings, and the writers of the New Testament, plus the very important coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell every believer, what Daniel wrote could be unsealed and understood by John's generation up to our day. Now, unfortunately, over generations since the time of John, the first century, Many have not opened up the prophecies and understood them properly. We've studied some of that in the history of these things. But we have no excuse not to know these things because we have all we need to have insight. Now, come John's day, they had what they needed to open them up and begin to understand what they meant. Now we have what we need to more fully understand Daniel as well. The time in John's day was the time necessary to open up, unseal, and see those things of Daniel. To put it simply, what Daniel sealed up, we now have opened in the book of Revelation. And we can go back and better understand Daniel as well. And that's why we keep crisscrossing between these two books over the years. Now, if you're alive back during the time of John's day and you are familiar with Daniel and you've received revelation during the time of John, you could say, now is that time. Now is the end of the many days that Daniel we referred to. Remember, end of the many days from now, that time of the end, uh, the end of time. Now you are getting the insight that's been held off for centuries. And now you're at the other end of this right now. So now's the time to understand not only the book of Revelation, but the book of Daniel. Now don't miss the fact that the time is near tells us, tells every generation, remember, the time is near at the end of our 
First, we're studying right now, okay, on the board. The time is near. It's time for us to have that insight. It tells every generation from the time of John that the conditions are such that these things could happen soon. We'll see more of that. As Daniel wrote, those who have insight will understand. For generations, believers would live under persecution and crisis situations to give them an experiential understanding in part of the future history before them. These crises are presented both individually and by churches as examples of what will happen through the generations until Christ comes. You've seen um, pilots probably land on carrier decks. One of the most difficult things to do uh, of any pilot in any service. Uh, And they do practice runs, practice runs. If you ever learn to be a pilot, you'll do your practice landings. And you will come down and not quite land yet, then you'll just hit the... uh, hit the throttle and fly right over the airfield, but you practice your approach until you do the real thing. So you do these practice runs over and over. Well, the thing about practice runs, they're very real. And the fact that you're going down, you haven't completely uh, lowered to the deck yet, but you fly around and come back again, line up and get ready until finally you're ready to, to go ahead and hit the deck. We've had a number of practice runs over the generations as Christians, as individuals, and as churches. We've went through a lot. There's been real persecution, real deaths, uh, real slaughters, in fact, of Christians uh, from various people over the generations, and the persecution is coming. Uh, John gives us information we need for the most intense persecution, but at the same time, Part of that information is the reward and blessing that comes to the faithful. And that's an important message we need to understand from studying Revelation. Uh, These things may start any time or they may start years from now. But either way, you're having practice runs all the time until the real deal happens. Now, you may die in your practice runs. That happens. But... That would be the Lord's will if you're remaining faithful to him. Let's put this another way. In other words, John was to have his book published and sent out immediately. Not like Daniel. John was to have it put out there right then. And folks, it's been out for some 2,000 years. And the added benefit of living in our day is that the last few generations have begun to sort out some of these prophetic teachings and get away from the wrong approaches to studying prophecy that carried the day for so many generations. But we have the truth open to us in so many ways. And you say, yeah, but you disagree with this guy and this guy. Let me tell you something. If you lived back 100 years ago, you probably wouldn't find anybody that was right. And if you did, they were few and far between. Now you have a number of scholars who got these things right, and yes, they do debate the details. But that's great. That's what you want. All right, it's like uh, a handful of doctors discovering the cure, and they're working out the details of how much do we administer, how often we administer, but we got the cure. And that's what we celebrate together. And so you find a couple of scholars that disagree that you both like. Study them both. Study the word. Make your own decision. But just don't say, well, he said that, and I like him, so he's, my, he's the one I'm going to believe. That's, that's elementary. That's not the way to approach things. It's a challenge for you to study the word. Uh, I don't shy away from differing from many scholars who are well-known and well-liked. Uh, obviously, uh, and this doesn't, it's not to be sound negative, but I don't care. I want the truth. It's your hunger for truth that I'm trying to feed. It's my own also. 
So let's stay faithful to God above all and stay faithful students to his word by digging in for ourselves. And then even if you don't get the answer you expected or you wanted, you'll understand why there's a difference. And you should celebrate that because they're being honest. The scholars are doing their best in being honest. So John is having his book published right away, started out sending it out to the seven churches. And keep in mind, these are those days that those in Daniel's days look forward to. Now understand that the next verse continues closely with the thought of this previous verse. So I'm going to read the previous verse again. Now, the following, before I read it, is a remarkable verse. Verse 11. In light of all that we've been studying in this book for the last few months. So let me read verse 10 again and we'll go right into verse 11. Then he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong and the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Now I can tell you folks, one of the remarkable things about this verse is that it has so much practical application. It's almost more than a lot of people want to handle, to be frank with you. First of all, let's break it down. Uh, our second person who says, uh, you do this. Okay, you're talking to somebody beside you, say, go do this. Third person man, means uh, you're going to tell someone for someone else to do something. All right? So when it says, let the one, all right, you are being commanded, all right, to let someone else do something. So that's a third person. Now in the English, we use this rather inadequate phrase, let the one. Uh, my Greek teacher used to point that out to us and say the way to understand this is, it is my will that you tell him to do this, something like that. It's a must command. And well, it's a command. Let has the idea of like, well, just let him. No, it's a command. All right, so don't miss that part. Now, some will take this as a permissive command, you know, like, like that. But I think they get that more from the English and not the Greek. But let's just get through this and understand what it's saying. So there's four third person commands. Now, they don't use the word let in every command. See, it says, let's look at the first line, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Then it, then if you're going to be literal, it's a, and let the one who is filthy still be filthy. We leave out the let because it's just not necessary in English. So we assume it's in there. Okay. So let's break this down. Let the one, let them do what they do. This is what this is saying. Let the one who does wrong still or continue to do wrong. First of all, understand this is what he must do. This is what he is geared to do. The word for do wrong, a general word for doing wrong. Adikeo, um, to wrong, to do wrong, to sin, evil, the range of sin. All right, so to do wrong is something that covers the whole range of sin. It can be just a simple, let's say, white lie to the most evil act. But this is saying, know this. Let them just go on doing their thing. You're probably thinking, well, wait a minute now. Are we supposed to stop them or discourage them or persuade them? Let's just get through this verse. And we'll sort this out a little better. But what this is saying is that this person has chose his path and this is what he's going to do. Don't expect any change. And this is connected with the last verse telling us that, what did it say? Remember at the end? Because the time is near. 
People have set their course. And this was written in John's day. So he has chose his path, and this is what he's going to do. And you're being told, just let them go their way. Don't expect to change. Time is short, and there's not time for them to really start a different course. Time is short. Now, this is not saying that people cannot change their mind. But if they do that, they will. It's their choice. Folks, the information is out there. It's been out there for generations. It's in more sources of access than ever before. All the ways we can get it on the internet, not to mention the media sources, the radio, the TV, shortwave, uh, all sorts of media categories, recordings, um, uh, video cassettes, okay, uh, digital, and then there's live voice. There's reading, all the sources of reading. The gospel has been out for generations. Uh, there's no excuse for anyone who wants the gospel to not who to hear it in some form. And we've talked about the principle, if a person truly desires to know God, God will provide the gospel message to them in some way. He may send a missionary, or they may hear it on a radio station, or they may run across someone's Bible in a hotel room. But they will get the message. And people choose their course. Do they want to pursue God or not? God will always respond to those seeking him. If they want to know him personally, they want to be forgiven, they want to turn to God, to know God, then they need to go through Christ, and that's when they'll get the gospel and have that opportunity to be saved. But it is their choice. Let's look at the second category. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. Now, this is a surprising one. Talk about the word filthy for a moment. Again, it's a third person imperative. The word for filthy, just what it means. Rupino, to defile or pollute oneself with sin. Filthy. You live in it. You wear it. You smell it. Uh, people identify you with it. Well, he's filthy. Or that's a filthy movie. Oh, well, there's plenty of those out there. In fact, they've seemed to have made it a point to make point of filth in every movie now. Uh, maybe not every one, but probably over 90%, at least the ones I've checked out. And uh, you don't expect anything anymore good. Um, so the point is, if that is what they want, that's what they're going to do. Do you want to be filthy? They'll be filthy. You're not going to stop them from being filthy. They will continue on living their lives in moral filth, and that is beginning more and more prominent in our society. And if people want to live in filth and they want to live in sin, you can't play both sides. You can't say, I'm going to be a moral leader and at the same time live in filth. Or if you live the double life, it'll catch up with you. And we all uh, battle a lot of these things, but it doesn't dominate our lives. I mean, we may have to turn our face from uh, some pornographic person or scene or uh, activity or uh, bad language, but that's something we have to constantly do to be on the alert for that. So don't mess the point. People are going to go their path. Let them do it. Let them do it. Then the positive side. This works both ways. Back to our verse. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. So John is telling you and me to let those people, those third, that third party, go about their business. The word for righteousness is,
Dikaio Sune, one we've seen many, many times, Dikaio Sune. He's just, he's fair, he's doing the right thing before God. The point is, the same point above, except on the positive side, this is what he's going to do, or she's going to do. If she's going to be that way, she's going to be that way. And you've been a, around people to know that when they want to change their mind, they will. Sometimes you can cry and plead and and try to persuade and demonstrate and show and point out all the bad things they've done in their lives and the bad things it's come up with. They don't care. I mean, they, they care that it hurt them or maybe hurt others, but they're not going to change. Next line. And the one who was holy still keep himself holy. And remember, we've taken out the let the one in here, good English. The word for holy, many times we've studied that as well. Hagios, it means to be set apart, particularly set apart from sin. You're going to live your life particularly set apart from sin. Uh, this is almost the opposite of filthy. You're not going to let yourself be tainted by that stuff. You're not going to watch that show. You're not going to do that thing. You're not going to hang out with those people or go to that place or expose yourself to that. Especially difficult with having children today because uh, this seems to be all over. I have not been in a public school for many, many years. I walked into one many years ago because I thought I'd get some paperwork from them. I don't remember what happened with that, but I haven't been in a public school, uh, nor my children, except the one who's a teacher, and he has his challenges. But we never sent our children to public school. Uh, we did let them go to college. Uh, three of them went to college. The other three, uh, they did not go to college. They had no desire to, and I'm not going to push it. If they change their mind, that's fine. There's time. But uh, it does more damage now than it does good, in my opinion. In my general opinion, if you go to college, you're going to get more junk than you are helpful. Now, how do you become a nurse or something like that? Well, then you have to go a special course. But uh, that's that's something that I've learned as a parent early, and thank God I did. We never sent our kids to public schools. We knew they would get fouled up from the very beginning. And sure enough, that's what happens. And even if they go off to college, they can get fouled up. Even if you spent years trying to instill in them what's right and what's wrong and what, what to watch out for. Well, let's understand the principle here. They're not going to do any major change in the time remaining. That's the point. Now, that's a kind of a shocking point, isn't it? It goes against much of the much of the preaching and teaching today. And I do tell you to witness. I do tell you to be faithful. Take the opportunity. But you can't push people into the gospel any more than you can push them to be moral. Once they've decided to go the immoral route and they're in the pleasures of sin and the world, it's very, very, very difficult, if not impossible. And you can spend many words and much time trying to persuade people back, and it's not going to work. When I was younger and I'd listen to some of the words of the old Christians, they would say these things that I know for real now. If your church is on the way down, it's apostate, and it's been on that path, and your leadership is apostate, you're not going to walk in there and change things. If anything, they'll change you. But that just doesn't happen. You say, well, I know it happened one time. Well, maybe it did happen one time. So that one out of a hundred time, you're going to spend your time and your effort and make new enemies to try to persuade apostate people to turn back to Christ. And all they have to do, folks, is change their mind. You present them the truth a couple of times. If they don't want it, you move on. And of course, each person has his own individual case, his own decision to make, but don't think you're the one that's going to change the world. Certainly not a church, if it's been on that path for a long time. This is not saying we do not witness, or that we don't encourage believers to stay faithful. Uh, we do that all the time. But you're not going to change people's paths once they've chosen them. Uh, just keep being honest with them. Keep letting them know that you believe what you believe. 
So this is saying that people choose the path they're going to follow. It is their path. You cannot change their mind. They have to do that. There's a lot of practical application here, a great deal of practical application. Let me just run through a few things. First, acknowledge that people choose their own path in life. That's part of having free will. If their free will doesn't choose it, and you somehow coerce them to do something they really don't want to do, well, it's not really their choice. They felt forced to do it, intimidated, uh, want to be part of the crowd, or part of the church, or part of the group, or part of the Bible study, or part of your family. Just keep giving them the truth, level with them, and if they accept it, fine. If not, depending how much you want to get along with them, you have to make your uh, compromises where you think it's still honest, if you know what I'm saying. If you want to invite them over for dinner, fine. But that doesn't mean you lie to them or you mislead them or you bait and switch them. Be honest with them. You're not a salesman for the gospel. You're not a salesman for Christ. You're a witness. You tell the truth. People choose whether they want that truth. Now, there are a lot of Christians who have a lot, hard time handling what I just told you because they've been so convinced that, well, we've got to persuade people. What do you mean by persuasion? You're going to talk them into it? What do you mean by that? Do you mean you're going to be honest with them and tell them the gospel? If they repent and turn to Christ in faith, they can be saved. If not, they're doomed forever. Is that what you mean by persuading them? Or are you going to say, well, you can avoid hell if you just do this and don't, don't water it down. That presents in a different light of what the truth is. Let them know. When Jesus gave the gospel, he gave the gospel. He told them you're going to stand condemned if you don't believe. Uh, in fact, you already are condemned. That's the way he put it. I didn't put it quite right myself. You are condemned. You're condemned already. That's the terms in John 3. One will do what one thinks he must do. Others' way to put this, now listen to this, live and let live. Folks, you can relax. You can relax. You're not going to change society. You're not going to change people. You're not going to change uh, the politics of things. Oh, yeah, you can vote. But if the morality has gone out of everybody or most everybody, it's not going to change much. We know that already. Now, the way to put this is a laissez-faire a laissez approach to people. Just let them do what they're going to do. Now, the principle. In fact, I'm going to put these up here. Let me see if I can get these up here. So we got live and let live, a laissez-faire approach to people. People choose sin for lifestyle. Understand that is what they will do. That is what they will do. People choose to live in moral filth. That is what they must do. They have their habits. They get off work. They go to the bar. They tie one on. They get into their filth, whatever it may be. And then they go on with their evening activity and start it over the next day. Well, I just say to me, that's a pretty horrible, boring life. On the other hand, there are some who choose to practice righteousness. Even some to live a more strict and holy life. I'm not going to have cable television. I'm not going to have those uh, things in front of my eyes. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to go there or do that. But you're not going to stop the tide of evil. Now listen to this. Once morality is thrown out, understand, if morality is thrown out, God is already being ignored. Evil will run its course. Sin will run its course. We study this in Scripture. Once sin has run its course, if that person is still alive, 
they may very well decide that this is really wrong and they bounce back, but it has to run its course. So those who live through that run may realize they spent most of their life on the wrong path, but by then for most, it's too late. They're 50, 60 years old. Oh, I've lived this way all my life. I can't change now. How many times you heard that? I can't change now. And sometimes people say that a lot earlier in life. I can't change now. And it's true. They choose not to change. And they don't have the willingness. That's their can't part. They could. It's just that they don't want to. And you can talk to them. And I've done this. I said, you could change if you wanted to. They truly believe they can't. Or somehow they got in their mind they're not good enough. And they explain to them grace. And it makes no difference. But I, that doesn't mean you don't still explain it to them. Don't misunderstand. Now once one understands this, then he can develop, develop the proper perspective on culture. Culture becomes bad because morality is ignored. And morality is ignored because people choose to do so. Once morality is tossed aside for such things as diversity and inclusion and equity and the like, society turns evil. There's no stopping that. You know what stops it? Judgment. Judgment will deal with that. How do we stop this uh, ongoing thrust by government and by people towards climate change? Judgment's going to change that. Judgment's going to change that. There will be self-destruction along with judgment. It won't work. It's self-destructive. People are self-destructive when they get on the path to evil. They will bring on their own judgments. Uh, many of that's just natural. You can't keep doing certain things, for example, in the economy that won't run the economy. In your personal life, you just can't keep spending and spending without balancing your budget. It'll be disastrous. It's the same way at the government level, of course. Now, for us as Christians, even if we have moral laws on the books that speak of freedom and personal God-given rights, like we do in the United States, Unless there is enforcement, and listen to this, by a moral system of law and order, it will not hold up. You ever tried to play a game as a kid, and someone comes in there and they say, uh, well, I don't follow the rules. Then how in the world do you play a game if they're always cheating? And that's the way it is today. There is so much cheating in the last election, and I expect there will be in the next one, that you don't know if the most popular and the person who should win will win because there's so much cheating going on. So the point is, if there are not moral people in place to hold it up, it won't hold up. So evil becomes the order of the day. And how do you stop it? It runs its course. And folks, we're at a point now where everything, I say everything, I'm exaggerating some, is going the way of evil. There's some resistance, that's true. But the tide of evil is there. Don't kid yourself. We keep on living righteous and holy lives. We stay faithful to God and his word. That's what you do you take care of yourself first. And you encourage those you love who are positive towards God around you to stay faithful. Uh, keep speaking truth to one another. Encourage one another. Uh, uh, be in contact with other believers, whether it be by emails or phone or uh, personal contact. Be encouraged. Now, we looked at these verses just a few minutes ago. Let's look at them one more time. I want to make sure we understand the relevance of the passage we're in. Daniel 12, 9 and 10 again. 
Then he said to me, Go, Daniel, for these words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Verse 10, Many will be purged and purified and refined, but the wicked will go on being wicked, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Daniel's being told basically the same message we read here in John. There's going to be a lot of purging, a lot of purified, a lot of refining. Yeah, Daniel says that. Then he says, but the wicked will go on being wicked. That's like saying the filthy are going to keep being filthy. Those who do wrong are going to keep doing wrong. Those who are different are those who have insight. And notice this middle line in verse 10, and none of the wicked will understand But those who have insight will understand. The wicked aren't going to understand it. They don't have the facilities to anymore. They're so damaged, they cannot comprehend the truth. So what we read in Daniel is basically the same principle we're reading here in John. But with Daniel, it was anticipating our day. Now we are at the time of the end. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to pay each one according to what he has done. Jesus interjects at this point. Behold, Jesus calls the reader's attention. Look here, I am coming soon, and my reward, we'll talk about that in a moment, I'm coming soon. This is to alert us that Jesus could come any time. This is the way we're supposed to live, anticipating his return. Many believers over many generations, I remember as a young man hearing it from old people saying, well, Jesus is coming back any day. And they really believe that, as many of you believe that now, that he could come back in your lifetime. And he certainly could. We have no guarantee but he certainly could, and that gives your life a hope and anticipation of things are going to change soon. But look what Jesus also says here. And my reward. Let's talk about that for a moment. The word is misthos, dues paid or wages. Jesus is bringing back what he has due to you. It's with him. It is Jesus' payment to give out, and he has it with him. He has the payroll, you might say. When Jesus returns, it starts a series of events determining what people will receive. For the believer, it is reward. For the unbeliever, it is judgment. Christ is coming soon to give people what they deserve. The word for pay, to pay, has the idea of give out or recompense. And notice, to each one, okay, to pay each one individual responsibility. To pay each one, each person is responsible, and he's going to receive what he deserves. And look at the standard, according to what he has done. Literally. It says, as his work is. It's in the singular here, representing his life for what he has produced. Now, folks, there's a big lesson here. Many Christians don't do much. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. That's the main thing. Well, in a way, that's true. But what are you a Christian still on earth for? Why are you still here? That's the follow-up question to serve him, to produce. You're rewarded according to what you do with your changed life. And this goes back to which path one chooses and continues to live. This is the sum total of one's work, whether it be a life from the results of sin and filth or righteousness and holiness. 
So in light of what we just saw in verse 11, some choose the path of sin and filth. Others choose to live a righteous and holy life. They will receive from Jesus what they have coming them. Now, folks, your path reflects in your lifestyle. Obviously, if they're filthy, they're sinners, they live in sin, uh, we can see that. If you're a Christian, you often have to look at that from two different, uh, in two different categories. There are those who are religious, who basically uh, pretend to be uh, faithful when in fact they're just religious. And by that I mean they follow the rules, they are moral, they enforce morality, but so do the Pharisees. Okay? Pharisees also added things. So do religious people. They add ritual. They add tradition. They add things that people need to do to satisfy what they consider a religious person to fit the religion of their choosing. Don't be fooled by that. Don't be caught in that. These are people who used to do nothing except reinforce their self-righteous, uh, self-defined morality. Now, there's nothing wrong with morality. Don't misunderstand. But when they start adding what morality is, you can't do this, you can't do that, and the Bible doesn't say you can't. Like, let's take drinking, for instance. You can drink. The Bible's very clear, though. Don't be drunk. Don't get drunk. And if you can't handle alcohol, don't get drunk. All right? Don't drink it. It's that simple. The point here is that Jesus will give people what they have coming to them. When Jesus comes back, people get what they deserve according to how they have lived their lives. I can tell you this, and this is in part from my own experience. If you determine to spend a good amount of time in the Word of God every day, reading it, reading it. Uh, I recently had uh, one eye operated on, and I can see a whole lot better. Can't hardly wait to get my other one operated on. I'll probably see better than I've seen in all my life. I've never saw well, seen well through my left eye. And uh, it's coming next in the operation procedures. Anyway, what I'm saying is I can't hardly wait to get back to just reading the Bible and not have to strain to do it. And not be so tired after just a little bit or so uh, blurry-eyed. And I mean that. It's so blurry-eyed just after maybe 20 minutes. He can't read anymore. But I've had the best vision the last two or three days I've had in, in I would say, a couple of years. <clears throat> and it's just going to get better, and I praise the Lord for that. It's, it's sort of like a new lease on life for me. Now, here's the point. Jesus is going to give back people what they deserve individually. If they remain unbelievers and follow the wrong ways or be filthy, there's judgment. If they choose to live righteous and holy lives, reward and, of course, we've seen many of these uh, rewards to the faithful. We saw that in the first letters to the churches. Verse 13, Jesus Christ asserts who he is. He's the one that's going to do it. So we're continuing on with Jesus Christ speaking. He's the one that's going to do the payout. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Let's start with the first phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is a title for God the Father back in 1.8 and 21.6. It is shared with Jesus here. Jesus also claims that title, that description. God the Father works through Christ the Son. We've studied that principle, something we really need to understand if we understand how God the Father and Jesus Christ relate to each other. It has the, it has the idea that everything comes from Christ and ends with Christ. All life, all being, starts and ends with God. Then the phrase, the first and the last, is only used for Christ in Revelation. We see that in 1.8 and 2.6 and again here. He is the first cause and the final end of things. Everything is dependent on him. He also says he's the beginning and the end. This is the idea that what the Lord starts, he finishes. He started everything going. He's going to finish it the way he wants. 
Now, all these descriptive uh, expressions of, of God, of Christ, particularly Christ here, express the sovereignty of God. He's running things the way he chooses. God created the world. It runs its course with his hand on it, his sovereign hand, and then he perfects it. Well, Jesus continues to talk in our passage. He gives the last beatitude and gives some contrast here. And that's where we'll start next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for your marvelous word, the challenge you have presented us, the obvious uh, privilege and advantages we have right now in this day and time. Help us never take granted for those, take those things for granted, but rather utilize them to your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.